Okay. We are going to do section 3.2. This is Math 171. Section 3.2 is exponential functions. 3.2. functions. Okay. We are on page 368 of your text. Okay. Make sure you are reading your book. Okay. I do most things, but I do not do all things in the book. So make sure you are reading your book. You'll get a lot of good information. It'll help you understand uh, these examples. It'll help set these things up. Okay, and it'll give you some of these little details that I don't have time to give you, uh, so make sure you're reading. Well, exponential functions um, are two, is a special type of function, and since we know how to find inverses, we're going to look at an exponential function, and we're going to look at the inverse of an exponential function. That's called a logarithmic function. That'll be section 3.3. Okay, so we're going to look at exponential functions first, then we're going to learn how to find the inverses of them, and that's going to be logarithmic functions. All right, and exponential functions are really important because they come up a lot in real life situations. There's a lot of things that grow exponentially, okay, and hence we need exponential functions to describe them. Uh, for example, bacteria growth, okay, bacteria grow exponentially. Now, exponential growth is a really, really fast type of growth. Exponential growth is a really, really fast type of growth, okay? Um, also, uh, compound interest is an example of exponential growth. If you could deposit money and earn compound interest on your money, then again, that's a fast type of growth, and it'll grow way faster than any uh, type of simple interest, okay? So again, these things come up in... A lot of them, a lot of natural situations, and they become really important to us. It's something we can get a lot of use out of. So the first thing I'm going to start off with is a definition of an exponential function. Okay? Definition of an exponential function. Okay? Definition of an exponential function. They say let B be a constant real number. Let B be a constant real number. Okay? And such that B greater than zero, such that B is greater than zero. Okay? And B is not equal to one. So B is a positive real number. It could be a fraction, it could be a decimal, it could be a whole number, but it has to be positive and it can't be one. It could be 0 0.75, it could be 0 0.99, it could be one half or three fourths, it could be two, it could be five, it could be 6.16. Has to be positive, but it can't be one, okay? For any real number X, for any real number x, okay? So x is any real number, positive, negative, whole number, fraction, decimals, whatever, okay? A function of the form f of x equals b to the x. Um, it's called an exponential function with base b. It's called an exponential function with base b. Okay? So, let b be a constant real number such that b is greater than zero and b is not one. Okay? So there's some pretty harsh restrictions on B, the base, right? 
um, for any real number X. There's no restrictions on X. X is anything that lives on the real number line. X could be the square root of two. X could be pi, okay? There are no restrictions on X. It could be positive, negative, whole, fractions, decimals, anything. Any number that lives on the real number line, okay? So no restrictions on X. So f of x or y equals b to the x, that's an exponential function, okay? y equals b to the x is called the exponential function with base b. The base is the b, okay? So let's just make sure we understand the concept. Let's look at some things that are exponential functions. And things that are not. of things that are exponential functions and we're going to look at things that are not exponential functions. f of x equals 3 to the x is an exponential function. f of x equals 3 to the x. That's an example of an exponential function. Okay? Alright. My base is 3. f of x equals b to the x. The base is 3 in this example. That's an exponential function. M of x equals x squared is not an exponential function. M of x equals x squared is not an exponential function. Why is that not an exponential function? Well, they said let that base b be a what? Constant real number. The base here is x. x is not a constant. x is a variable. So the base is not a constant. That's why this is not. An exponential function. To be an exponential function, the base has to be a fixed number. It can't be a variable. The base must be a fixed number. Second example of an exponential function, g of x equals one third to the x. That's an exponential function. My base, b to the x, the base is one third. That's perfectly fine. The base is a constant real number that's positive, and it can't be one. Well, one third is a constant, and it's positive, and it's not one. So that is a exponential function. N of x equals negative one third to the x. This is not, not an exponential function because my base is negative base is negative. The base has to be positive. So that's an example of something that is not an exponential function. h of x equals square root of 2x. This is a exponential function. Again, the base just has to be positive and it can't be 1. So that's an exponential function. p of x equals 1 to the x is not an exponential function. The base is 1. The base is 1 in that example. And we said the base can't be 1. So those are examples of exponential functions. So we see that exponential functions can take a lot of different, um, it can look a lot differently, right? But again, we're just following the rules. The base has to be a constant real number. The base has to be positive. The base can't be 1. That exponent, x, b to the x, the exponent can be virtually anything, any real number that exists. But again, there's some real concrete, um, concrete restrictions on that base. The base must be a real number that's positive, but it can't be one. Anything else works. All right, so hopefully we can tell now when something is or is not an exponential function. Okay, hopefully we can tell. The next thing we want to make sure we understand is how we go back and forth from exponential to radical form. Well, 4 squared is 16. That's easy. 4 squared is 16. All right? But 4 to the 1 half power, and again, I'm making sure I understand how to go back and forth between rational or, or yeah, rational 
in exponential form. Okay? This is exponential form. I've got an exponent. Exponential form. But I can write this as the square root of 4. This is radical. I've got a radical sign. And it turns out that this thing is 2. 4 squared is 16. The square root of 4, though, is, I can write square root of 4 is this. This is exponential form. I've got an exponent. This is radical form because I've got a radical sign. Turns out to be 2. Okay? I could write 4 to the 10 over 23rd. Again, that's exponential form. I've got an exponent. Well, this becomes the 23rd root of 4 to the 10. That's radical form. Again, whenever you have a fractional exponent, the denominator becomes the index of the radical. That little number on the top of the radical is called the index. And then this other number just becomes the exponent on that base. The base is 4. Remember, b to the x, base is 4. My exponent is 1 half. b to the x, the base is 4. The exponent this time is a 10 over 23. Okay? And I can do this with any number. I can say 7 to the 2 thirds power. That means the cube root of 7 squared. Exponential form, radical form. Okay? So I'm going to have to understand how to go back and forth from those two different forms. That's going to come up in the homework. So I wanted to make sure that we saw this in case we hadn't seen it before. And sometimes things will, will simplify, right? If, I, if I've got 8 to the 3 halves power, right? If I've got this before, if I have 4 to the 3 halves power, that means the square root of 4 cubed. And again, the square root is the only one where I don't write the index. The index technically is 2, but when you have an index of 2, you don't have to write it. Every other index you have to write, if it's 3 or above, you'll see the number, cube root, right? Or um, 10 to the 3 fourths. That would be the fourth root of 10 cubed. Okay. All right. So anytime the index is something other than two, you have to see it. But when you have a square root, you don't have to write the index. It's understood to be an index of two. So four to the three halves power is the square root of four cubed. And sometimes, again, these things simplify. Four cubed means four times four times four. Four times four is 16. 16 times another four makes a 64. Right? Square root of 64 turns out to be 8. So sometimes these rational expressions these in exponential form will simplify, and I just get a simple, straightforward number out. Sometimes they don't. Like, I can't simplify the cube root of 7 squared. I, can't, I get an approximation with the calculator. But sometimes these expressions will simplify. I went from rational um, exponential form, something with an exponent, b to the x. My base is 4. My exponent is 3 halves. I turned it into radical form, something with a radical sign, and then it just happened to simplify. So hopefully you understand how to go from this exponential form to that radical form, if you didn't before. All right? That's the first thing. So now we know when things are exponential functions. Okay? We know when something is an exponential function now. And the first thing we're going to do is graph it. Example one, graph. Graph. And A says f of x equals 2 to the x. So I've got this exponential function. I'm going to graph it. f of x equals 2 to the x. Well, you can use a teacher. A teacher will graph any function that exists if you get enough points and the right points. You can use that little t-chart. Choose x, plug it in the function, get the y. You can use that little t-chart to graph any function that exists if you use um, the right points and enough points. So, if x was 0, 2 to the 0, you can do it on the side if you want. Anything to the 0 power is 1. When x is 1, 2 to the 1 power, that's 2. When x is 2, 2 squared, that would be 4. And you can do some negatives. When x is negative 1, 2 to the negative 1, now again, this is that exponential form. Whenever you have a negative exponent, if you flip it over, 
the exponent changes sign, so if I move that 2 to the negative 1 into the denominator, it becomes 2 to the positive 1. But 2 to the positive 1 is just 2, so that's 1 half. And I wrote 2, I never did it. 2 squared was 4, there it is. Negative 1, I get 1 half. Negative 2, 2 to the negative 2 becomes 1 over 2 to the positive 2. The 2 to the positive 2 is 4, so 1 fourth. And if you want, you can do more points. I think this is probably enough. X, Y. All right, zero, one. Right here. One, two, I go over one, up two. 2, 4, go over 2, up 4. Negative 1, 1 half. Negative 1, 1 half. Negative 2, 1 fourth. And it's obvious what the function is doing. There's the graph of y equals 2 to the x. Okay. There's the graph of y equals 2 to the x. All right. Well, part B, B says graph G of X, and I'm going to write it here because I'm going to use, I'm going to apply that on the same graph. G of X equals one half to the X. G of X equals, or do I want to apply that on the same graph? Yeah, I'm going to apply on the same graph. G of X equals one half to the X. All right, let's do another T chart. X and Y. And again, I can do the same point. Zero, one, two. Uh, negative one, negative two, et cetera, et cetera. So plug a zero in here. One half to the zero power. Again, anything to the zero power is one. Zero, one. Put a one in there. One half to the one. Well, that's one half. Put a two in there. One half squared. One squared gives you a one. And the bottom two squared gives you a four. One fourth. One half to the negative one. Okay, now I'm plugging in x equals negative one. Well, whenever you have a fraction, a fraction to a negative power, that's the same thing as the fraction flips over and the exponent changes sign. Whenever you have a fraction raised to a negative power, if you flip the fraction over, the exponent changes sign and become positive. Okay, so that's one half, two over one to the positive one power. That's just two. Negative two. Again, I've got a negative power. Flip the fraction over. The exponent becomes positive. Two squared gives you a positive four. So there's my points. Remember that fact. Whenever you have a fraction to a negative number, if you flip the fraction over, the exponent changes sign. Always. All right, let's plot those points. Zero, one. That was right here, same point. One, one half. One, one half. Two, one fourth, two, one fourth. Negative one, two. Negative two, four. So there's g of x. That's g of x. This was f of x. Okay? Well, it turns out that if you understand those two graphs, if you understand those two graphs, then you basically understand how every graph works for these exponential functions. If you understand those two graphs, then you now understand how every graph of an exponential function will look. Because it's gonna look like one of those two things, okay? With the B, remember the base is one half in this case, the base is a two in that case. Whenever the base is less than one, it's gonna do that. Whenever the base is greater than one, it's gonna do that, okay? Whenever the base is less than one, the graph will look like that, it will always go through, the, all of them will always go through this, no matter what the base is. All exponential functions go through the point zero one. If the base is less than one, it starts at positive infinity, comes down and goes to the x-axis, x-axis is y equals zero. If the base is greater than one, it starts at 
y equals zero, the x-axis, essentially, almost, anyway, it never touches it, and it goes off to positive infinity. All exponential functions will behave in this way. Whenever the base is less than one, they behave in that way. Whenever the base is greater than one, they behave in that way. So you now, now, you now know, essentially, what every exponential function does, okay? So they give us, on page, um, page 370, kind of properties of the exponential function. Properties of the exponential function. Okay? And they say one, if b is greater than one, x equals b to the x is an increasing function. Increasing function. Okay. Starts at zero, increases. This is called exponential growth. Starts at zero. Again, this thing gets closer and closer to the x-axis. The x-axis is exactly where y equals zero. So it starts at zero, goes off to infinity. Exponential growth. Exponential growth is a very, very fast type of growth. Okay? If b, b has to be greater than zero but less than one, right? f of x equals b to the x is decreasing the decreasing function that's an example of exponential decay that's an example of exponential decay that's this thing you start off at infinity you go to zero okay that's exponential decay okay the domain for both the domain for any exponential function is negative infinity to infinity. Okay? The range for any exponential function zero to infinity. The y values go from zero to infinity. The x values start off here, negative infinity goes to infinity. If it's this one, it starts off negative infinity, goes to infinity. So the x is ranged from negative infinity to infinity. The y start at y equals zero, go to infinity. Y equals zero is the horizontal asymptote. Y equals zero is the horizontal asymptote. Y equals zero is the x-axis. Okay? And all exponential functions pass through zero, one. this part right here because f of zero is one in both cases. For all exponential functions, they all pass to the point zero comma one. Okay? So these are the properties of the exponential functions. All exponential functions. And again, we have to distinguish. When b is greater than one, it's an increasing function. When b is greater than one, it starts at infinity, it's a decreasing function. Then after that, all of these are shared properties. B greater than one is exponential growth. B greater than zero less than one, exponential decay. Exponential decay, if you want to think about maybe uh, nuclear materials. Nuclear materials. When you have nuclear power, 
and you use these atoms to you split atoms all the rest and you get all this energy. Well, you have these leftovers, this nuclear waste. And the problem is, what do you do with that waste? Because nuclear waste, just like exponential growth, is a really fast growth. Exponential decay is a really slow decay, right? Two sides of, of a coin. Exponential growth is a really fast growth. Exponential decay, it goes away really slowly. So that's the problem with nuclear materials. Nuclear waste, you know, you might take one gram of some plutonium or something. It might take 10,000 years for that stuff to dissipate and not be radioactive. In other words, not be dangerous. So after you gain the energy from those products, what do you do with them for the next 10,000 years so that people will be protected and people won't be exposed to radiation and get cancer? You have to put those things away in. They, they burn them sometimes. They put them in these containers. But what do you do with that stuff? So there's problems with all that stuff. All right, so now we know basically how exponential functions behave. All right, let's do one more of these examples real fast of graphing these things. Okay, let's do another graph, and let's do <coughs> let's do some of these transformations. We know how to graph functions, and we know how to do vertical transformations. We know how to do horizontal transformations. So let's apply that to these exponential functions. Okay. Let's apply that to these exponential functions. Example two, graph. Graph. They say f of x equals, and they say three to the x minus two power. Okay? And they say plus four. to the x minus 2 power plus 4. I want to graph this thing. Okay? Well, the basis function, I started out with this function. 3 to the x is my basis function. That's what I start with. That minus 2, whenever I take my x variable and I subtract 2, that's going to be a horizontal translation in the x direction. And horizontal translations, if you remember, were counterintuitive. Even though I said x minus 2, x minus 2, that actually pushes the graph forward two units in a positive x direction. x minus 2 would push the graph forward two units. So let's just make sure we understand the graph. x and y. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and... Uh... Okay, let's do a t-chart. All I'm graphing now is y equals 3 to the x. Well, 0, 1, we just talked about that. 0, 1 is on the graph of every exponential function. So right there, okay? When x is 1, 3 to the 1 gives me 3. So 1 comma 3. If x were 2, 3 squared would give you 9. Just, it's not on the graph, but we kind of know where it is. That's fine. If x were negative 1, if x were negative 1, 3 to the negative 1 would be 1 over positive 3. Remember, we have a negative exponent. Flip it to the bottom, exponent becomes positive. So, 1 third. If x were negative 2, 1 ninth. Okay. 2 comma negative 2, 1 ninth. So, you know what it's doing. There's that graph. So that's the graph of y equals 3 to the x. Now, g of x, I'm going to call this g of x, x minus 2. That just takes this graph and slides it forward two units. So this point moves over two units to here. This point moves over two units, one, two to here. This point, one, two to here. So it's the same graph, essentially, just moved over two units. So there's 3 to the x minus 2. And then the plus 4 just takes this graph. So I don't want him anymore. I want to take this graph. Okay? 
When I say plus four, all that does is every point shifts up four. So one, two, three, four. Well, there used to be, um, yeah. So that's up four. This point moves up one, four. To here. So it's going to do this. And the old, the old horizontal asymptote used to be y equals zero. That moves up to y equals four. So you can take a look at your book, but that's how that would work. We do our horizontal shift first, then we do a vertical shift to four. The old asymptote at y equals zero moves up to y equals four, okay? And that would be the graph. So you can look at that. Um, next thing we're gonna talk about is y equals e to the x, okay? Y equals e to the x. And again, read this text. This is really, really, really important that you read this section. Because I'm not going over everything that I see, a lot of it. I want you to read, and I think you'll get it. But I don't have time to go over every single detail, so make sure you've read this. Um, the natural, natural, natural exponential function. Natural exponential function is this, f of x equals e to the x. My base is e, and where e is approximately 2.718. It keeps going, but it's there. This is called the natural exponential function. In other words, it's the um, exponential function with base e. The base is at E, which is 2.718. And again, the base just has to be positive. The base can't be 1. So this is called the natural exponential function because it comes up a lot in nature. We found it because it just keeps popping up. Okay, This is called the natural exponential function. Okay, Function with base E. Now, on your calculator, you have an E to the X key. So you'll be able to do this. If you wanted to, and we're going to do it now. Let's do it in graphic. They say graph this. Graph. Okay? So when I say x, y, I'm just going to choose some points. If I say 0, take your calculator and put e to the 0. e to the 0, anything to 0 is 1. That's easy. Put a 1. e to the 1. Take your calculator. Well, e, we just said, is 2.718. So anything to the first power which comes just that number. So I'm just going to round it to 2.8 because I can't plot 2.718 on the graph. And then I'm going to put in x equals 2. X equals 2, they say you get 0.13, uh, you get 7.389. I'm going to call that 7.4. Okay. Let's do some negatives. When you do negative 1, e to the negative 1, they say is 0.368. And again, just do this on your calculator. You should calculator in that e to the x key. When you get negative 2, you get 20, no, I'm sorry, 0.135. Okay? And again, we kind of know what the graph is already. Because again, all exponential functions kind of look the same. So 0, 1, we knew it went through that point, all exponential functions do. 1, 2.8, I go 1, 2.8, eh, about right there, I don't know. 2, 7.4, well, somewhere up here, I don't care. Negative 1.4, about right there. Negative 2.1, and again, we knew what it had to do. The B is positive, so it has to do that. It's an increasing function, all right? Um, nothing hard about that. Um, yeah, easy stuff, easy stuff. Again, you have an e to the x key on your calculator. That's what you use to plot those points. Uh, the next thing is using exponential functions to calculate compound interest, okay? Using exponential functions to compound, calculate, I'm sorry, compound interest. 
So that's on page 374. So page 374, again, make sure you've read all this. They say, suppose that P dollars say in principle is invested in principle is invested and they say or borrowed okay um, at an annual interest rate R for two years at an annual interest rate R Secondly, A equals P, 1 plus RT, okay, uh, 1 plus R over N. T, T power, okay, N T power, sorry. This is compound future value A of the account. And then finally, A equals P, E to the RT. And this is uh, future value A after T years, continuous compound. I'm just going to write continuous compound. So you're going to have to read the section before this to fully understand this. So read that section before this. And then we arise at these three formulas. So this is when I am either, if I am a lender, then they, that's why they say, suppose that P dollars, so I'm gonna take P, $10,000. Suppose P is $10,000. And I'm gonna invest it. If, I'm a, if I got a lot of money, I invest 10,000. If I am poor, I borrow 10,000, right? At an annual interest rate R for two years. So those, I take $10,000, I borrow $10,000, at a 4.5% interest rate for six years, okay? I can use this formula to calculate the simple interest, okay? All right? And again, simple interest is when you earn money only on the amount you borrowed or lent. Simple interest is when you earn money on only, or interest is accrued only on the money, the initial amount that's borrowed or lent. With simple interest, interest is only accrued on the money that you initially borrowed or the money that you initially lent. This is how I can figure out the future value A, again, on that same amount of principal P, same interest rate, annual interest rate R, but now N is the number of compound periods per year. So compound interest is different from simple interest. Again, read this in your text. I'm not gonna go through it all, but compound interest is completely different and way better for you if you're depositing money at compound interest versus simple interest. So with compound interest, this N is the number of compounding periods per year, okay? So suppose interest is compounded monthly. Interest is compounded monthly. So N would be 12. If, if, if interest is compounded monthly, N would be 12. So what that means is if I loan you money, $10,000 at 4.5% interest, compounded monthly for four years. Well, after each month, interest is gonna be calculated on the amount that you borrow, okay, after each month. And then that interest adds to the principal. 
So you not only earn money on the initial amount you loaned or borrowed, right? But interest is also accruing on that amount of interest that that money gained per compounding period. Again, read that section, it should make sense. So that's how I can find the future value on the compound interest. This is interest compounded continuously. And so now this is that exponential growth because I see e to the RT power. Okay, so this would be the formula for continuous compounding interest. And the more you compound interest, the more money you earn if you are the lender, the more money you will pay if you are the borrower, right? So as the compounding periods go up, like I can compound, I can compound annually, once a year. I can compound semi-annually, twice a year. I can compound monthly, 12 times a year. I can compound daily, 365 times a year. Or this says continuous compounding. Continuous compounding is like, the idea is, I compound every interest, not even every second, but every 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 increment I compound. That's called continuous compound. So with that in mind, with that in mind, let's work this example. And again, read the section before this to have a complete understanding of simple versus compound versus continuous compounded interest. Okay, you're gonna need to read all that stuff prior to this. With that in mind, example four, suppose 5,000 is invested. Suppose $5,000 is invested. They say at 6.5% interest per year, So let's say 10 years. T equals 10. T equals 10 years. And I'm going to find the future value for each. Okay, I'm going to find the future value for each. So A says monthly. B says quarterly. C says, oh, A was annually. I'm sorry. A was annually. I'm so sorry. Annually was A. B was quarterly. C was monthly. Okay. D is daily. E is continuous. Okay. And I want to find the future value I have after each. All right, so we're going to do them annually, quarterly, we're going to do monthly, we're going to do daily, and then continuously. So, we're going to make sure we understand. So, if it's annually, N is the number of compounding periods per year. So, N would be one annual. If it's quarterly, that means four times per year. If it's monthly, that means N equals 12 times per year. If it's daily, that means N equals 365 times a year. 
right? And if it's continuously, I can't really say that. I can't really write that. You're just going to have to use that continuous compound form, okay? So when I plug this stuff into here, my future value would be P. And they said 5,000. One plus R. R was interest rate, but again, to use interest rates, you have to convert them to decimals. To use interest rate, you have to convert it to decimals. So 6.5%, I don't know if you remember this, it's the same thing as 0 0.065 in decimals. You drop the percentage sign and you move your decimal two places to the left to convert from percentage to decimal. Drop your percentage sign, move your decimal two places to the left to convert from percent to decimal. You have to convert a percentage rate to decimal before you can use it in a formula. So, P, one plus R over N, in this case the M one, to the RT, so I'd have 0.065 times one. When I do all that in your calculator, they say you will get 9385.69. That's how much you wind up after um, 10 years in that first account that earns compound interest at 6.5% for 10 years. When n is 4, a would be P, 5,000, 1 plus 0.065, R over N, in this case N is 4 this time, and then 4 times 10, oh I'm sorry, R 10, this is a 10 right here, R times T, R is your interest rate, T is your time, so um, 0.065 times 10. And here you have 0.065 um, times, um, oh wait a minute, it's n times, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let's write the formula so we don't make certain mistakes. So the formula was A equals P, 1 plus R over N, to the N T, I'm sorry, N times T. So 1 times 10 would be 10. In this case, 4 times 10 would be 40. Right? N times 10. So they say you'll get 95, 27, 79 in the second case. 95, 27, 79. Okay? And we see we earn more money. I went from 93, 85, 69 to 95, 27, 79 as I increased my compounding periods from 1 to 4 times a year. 12 times a year, 5,000, 1 plus 0 0.065 divided by 12. 12 times 10 is 120, okay? Do that in your calculator, 95, 60, 92. Now n equals 365, the future value 8, 5,000, 1 plus interest rate divided by n, n is 365 now. n times t, 365 times 10 would be 36.50. Do that in your calculator. 95, 77, 15. And finally, continuous plug a equals p, 5,000. E to the RT, 0.065 times 10. I don't have any when it's continuous compound. 95, 77, 70. Didn't go up a lot, but it went up. Again, continuous compounding is the fastest growing interest that exists. Okay? So that's how we find, uh, how we apply those formulas to calculate interest. Okay? Um, I'm going to do a little bit of example five, but not all of it, just to make sure you understand how exponential decay works. I'm going to do the first part of the example 
and others I will leave to you. Okay. Example five. Okay. They say the half life of radium 226. That's just one of those radioactive elements in the periodic chart. It's 1,620 years. Okay? If a sample originally having one gram, if a sample originally having one gram, Um, of radium-226 okay um, in a sample not if a sample in a sample in a sample originally having one gram of radium-226 the amount A of T They say after. So A says 1620 years. Okay. So the half life of radium 226 is 1620 years, and it's sample originally having one gram of radium 226. The amount A of T in grams of radium 226 present after T years is given by that formula. And that's clearly an exponential function. All right, I've got a base, one half, to a power, t over 1620. How much radium will be present after 1620 years? So they gave me time. Time is 1620. So where I have a time, I'm going to put 1620. Everywhere I have t, I'm going to put 1620. Because it's t over 1620, so 1620 over 1620. Well, that's just one half to the one, one half. So one half gram. So I started out with one half, with one gram, having one gram of radium 226. 1,620 years passed, and I've still got a half a gram left. Again, it decomposes or decays really, really slowly. So this is how exponential decay works with these radioactive elements. They decompose very slowly. B and C work the exact same way. B says 30 to 40 years. B says T equals 30 to 40. So I'd have A of 30 to 40 equals 1 half to the 30 to 40 over 1620. And just put that in your calculator, right? Put that in your calculator. And they say you'll get uh, 3240 over 1620 actually turns out to be two. So this is one half squared. Take your calculator later. 3240 divided by 1620 is two. One half squared is one fourth of a gram. So after 3240 years, I started off with only one gram of that stuff. That's not very much. And after over 3000 years, I've still got a quarter of a gram. 
of that stuff left. So again, exponential decay is a really, really slow type of decay, just like exponential growth is a really, really fast type of growth. And with that, we are done with 3.2. If you have any questions, issues, concerns, please reach out to me.